Welcome to the Visually Hidden Podcast, where we discuss an independent approach to the art of cinema and explore the subtext of various featured films. My name is Peter O'Brien, and I'm an independent filmmaker, author, and musician. My name is Steven Bendler. I'm a film and stage actor and a pop culture enthusiast. I'm Anne Milleville, a French screenwriter and producer. So welcome back, guys. I, um, I, I, you know, with the start of the new year and last week we talked about new films we've been seeing and then I tied it back into old films because they're just more accessible. It's easier to see something that's already been out for a while than it is to necessarily drop everything and get to the theater, especially as you move through your life and you have family and other obligations and work. It's not always easy to get to the cinema. So I find myself a lot of times either searching for stuff on streaming or even trying to track down physical media. And I was just wondering if you guys had a similar experience with that. Like, what's your approach to finding your entertainment? I feel like a good quarter of my life has been devoted to hunting down copies of things that I want or specific copies of things that I want. I'm a physical media collector. I am very particular in what I want. And sometimes you got to get creative. In some cases, there's been some films, I guess the interest isn't there for certain films. Uh, they're just out of print, right? And almost, almost lost and gone mm -hmm. forever. So in two cases, I had to go to eBay where I bought copies of something that someone had just burned themselves, but they did a pretty good job. They actually, mm -hmm. there was like a, you know, they kind of copied the picture on the disc and they, they copied the artwork of the of the DVD itself. So I have Disorderlies with the Fat Boys uh, on the print <laughs> copy and I have a movie called Body Slam, which is an old wrestling movie with Rowdy Roddy Piper. I think right now I have about 50 or 60 DVDs, mainly uh, from uh, actors or directors that I like. That's something I like to collect in a way, but um, as I said, I think it's less intense than you. <laughs> I don't track them down. It's just when I see it, I, I buy it. I do have one exceptional story about a pursuit. I was looking for a film once. It came out on the Criterion Collection. It's a Akira Kurosawa film called Ron. It came out on DVD and it went out of print, not almost instantly, but within a season. It was not one that they produced for a long time. And so then it wound up on eBay for like $120. And Criterion discs are already pretty expensive if you know anything about them. So $120 for this movie. And I just couldn't. It's it's against a lot of my principles. You know, I won't even spend, you know, that much to go to a concert. It's not because I'm cheap. It's because I just have uh, better ideas of value for my money. But I really wanted to have the Criterion version of this film. And one day I was in a thrift store with my wife. She was buying some shirts and they had DVDs in the back of this store. And I'm scanning through and I get to the end of the line and there it is. The Criterion collection of Ron. And I pick it up and my eyes almost jump out of my head. My like heart almost jumped out of my throat. I open it up. The discs are clean. No scratches, no scuffs, no fingerprints. Wow. The booklet is there. The price tag says $5. Wow. <laughs> I bring it up to my wife, and because she bought $20 worth of shirts, it was free. Oh, wow. That's the kind of story that brings a tear to your eye. How's that for a silver lining? That's good. But again, this one went out of print. It was not anywhere. I would like make love to it with my eyes at Tower Records. That's how long ago this was. Tower Records. It was 2006. And I didn't get it until maybe 2016. So 10 years. That's patience. That's Jedi right there is what that is. That's probably my best uh, story of pursuit. Otherwise, yeah, sometimes I will just go on eBay and, uh, you know, if it's reasonable, a lot of times, especially with old media, people are a lot more receptive to let it go now. But so every now and then there's a title that pops up where it's like, it's just super rare or that that edition is super rare and you got to either pull the trigger or hold your breath. I'll tell you, I think one of my best discoveries out in the wild, right? Years ago, I worked in the city and there was a couple small shops scattered throughout the city that would sell brand new DVDs, but at really low prices. And sometimes it was like a, a French import. So I have a couple Superman that have like the, also the French title on there also, a three <laughs> and four I have like that. But the I think the best for me was I desperately wanted the complete series of The Incredible Hulk. I loved that oh. TV show. And that's what got me into the Hulk as a kid was that show. I never read the comic, but the show is what was like my gateway. And I wanted this box set. And every time I looked it up, it was either like 120 or up. 
And like you, Pete, there's some some things I just can't do. I just can't spend that much money on that type of thing. But I was in the store one day perusing on my lunch break, as I did almost every day, and they happened to have a brand new copy of the Incredible Hulk complete series. I think I grabbed it for like 50 bucks. So that was one of my greatest discoveries in the wild. Last episode, we talked about character arcs and we discussed the film Bad Boys starring Sean Penn. And I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because I was thinking about it more as we move into this week and this week's film with uh, with our main topic of typecasting and just how easy it would have been for Sean Penn to get typecast after that film. But I feel like because he came off of Spicoli and then he went into something a little bit different, he didn't necessarily get boxed into that tough guy character persona. I think that's one of the things that um, helps an actor establish themselves is making those decisions. You know, sometimes they just fall into a situation where it's like, oh, well, yeah, I'm good at this and I can do this and the money's good or the offer's good. I'm going to keep doing this. And then it gets, you know, two, three films down the road and they're like, what did I do? (laughs) I often think of uh, when it comes to typecasting, I think of Jim Carrey. Yeah. You know, he had great success in comedies. He had done a few comedy films in the 80s that most people aren't aware of or have forgotten about. He really kind of broke out in 1994. That was the year of Jim Carrey because he had Ace Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber all within a calendar year. crushed it. After that, he was just, he was untouchable in the realm of comedy. But even when he deviated from the course, even a little bit, like the cable guy, Mm -hmm. the cable guy was just a little too dark for audiences and it didn't do well. And then- When he tried to break out of the straight comedy altogether with the Truman Show, it kind of blew up in his face and man on the moon, you know, clearly he was he was capable of doing it. I think Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is one of his best films, and that is nowhere near the comedy he was doing, but it took him 10 years, just like my pursuit of Ron. (laughs) To get where he wanted to be, to find that success. Yeah. So there's there's something to be said in all well, of he, that. Well, he did win the Golden Globe, I think, for Truman Show, and he definitely won it for uh, Man on the Moon. But I, I think what what hurt him a little bit, what, unfortunately, was uh, the Majestic. I personally enjoyed the film. I really I, I own it. Um, I own a great many of his movies, but he wasn't really re- received well for that one. I think he did that in 2001, and then a couple of years later, yeah, he hits you with Eternal Sunshine. It's like whoa. I have a question for Steve. As I was uh, looking for um, typecast actors, of course, I had Jim Carrey in a head, but also um, I thought of Jennifer Aniston from Friends Mm -hmm. and uh, Bren Cranston also from Malcolm and then Breaking Bad. You know, it's completely different. I realized that every time it's an actor most known for comedies, he can move to, to drama, but an actress from drama, it's more complicated to, to come to comedies and I wanted to know if you had this experience, but how do you feel about that? It, it's easier to, to make drama than comedies? Comedy is very, very hard. There's so many levels of comedy and it's understanding the type of comedy and where it's appropriate, and where it's not appropriate. It's a fine line. I'm not saying drama is easy, but sometimes it could be more relatable. You know, you know, Jeff Daniels in the bathroom scene in Dumb and Dumber, he had to go all in for that or it's not going to be funny. You know, where some people can't make themselves look that foolish or afraid to look that foolish. But, you know, having an argument scene with, with, with a wife, you know, like you're playing the husband, here's your wife, you're having an argument that seems more relatable and less embarrassing. So sometimes it's, a, it's just willing to go there with yourself is what makes the difference. Oh, really interesting because it's true that when you, you watch drama, you think, oh my God, it's so hard to cry on demand, to, you know, to to fall down in despair. I don't know, but it, it, you're right that maybe in comedy, you have to be uh, completely involved in what you're saying. Otherwise, uh, you can have a face, but if the body doesn't follow it, it, it doesn't work, you know? So yeah, very interesting. Yeah. There's an old saying that, that the best comedy comes from pain, from real life pain. And a lot of these comedians that we adore, like Jim Carrey and some of these other people have been through a lot of stuff in their life and you don't realize it, but they use that. And that, that kind of is what fuels them to make other people laugh, to make themselves laugh, to get away from whatever is is bothering them. So they already have a wealth of emotion because some of the funniest people in the world have a lot of pain going on. And when they get a chance to to share that with the world, um, I think it's a little bit easier for them. 
with comedy, sometimes comedy is a lot more subjective. There are a lot of different kinds of comedy. There's subtle comedy, there's dry comedy, there's slapstick comedy, there's physical comedy. And a lot of people like Jim Carrey, he can he can run the gamut. He can do it all in that regard. And there are some actors who can do that. But when you are so ingrained and so associated with a specific style of entertainment, to then move into something else. And Anne had mentioned Brian Cranston before, you know, he was on Malcolm in the Middle. And before that, he I mean, he was he was in a lot of things. He popped up on yeah, Seinfeld a few times as a recurring character. You know, he pops up in all these other shows and then he gets on Malcolm in the Middle, which is a comedy and he's hilarious and brilliant in it. And then he moves into Breaking Bad, which is a totally <laughs> different kind of character. And he goes in different places. And from there, then people can see, oh, I, I accept him now. And it's only because of the reoccurring episodic presentation of him in that character where you get it in pieces, you get it in installments. It's small doses. You know, everybody knows he's a great actor now. <laughs> they didn't know it 20 years ago, but it's something that, uh, you know, just kind of you got to, again, pursue and follow but it's it's very very hard to make that jump when you're so ingrained in a particular genre yeah. you know malcolm mcdowell in a clockwork orange which we talked about a few weeks ago as well sometimes it's that breakthrough performance the shadow is so big that it's hard for people to accept or people to understand christopher reeve as superman is another mm -hmm. one he had tons of offers after superman and what did he choose somewhere in time a little small romantic character driven movie not a big action movie not another big epic adventure or special effects film no small movie character driven because he's a theater guy and that's what he wanted to do and even after that superman 2 okay great superman 3 superman 4 and then he falls off the a-list in the 80s because you know switching channels was not the best decision <laughs> and it just became a little bit of a struggle for him through the 90s until his uh, you know very unfortunate accident but he's a great actor and i think if people went back and looked at his filmography they'd be pleasantly surprised by some of the films he made and they were small films you want a good Christopher Reeve film that you probably haven't heard of? It's based on a play called Noises Off. Michael Caine, Christopher Reeves, John Ritter, Carol Burnett. It's a, it's a tremendous cast. Very funny movie. Check it out. Christopher Reeves is very funny in it. I also recommend Death Trap if you're looking for good Christopher Reeve. I've been trying to find that one. Again with Michael Caine. So talk about hunting down some, there's some films I cannot find. I wouldn't, I've been dying to watch Death Trap. It's never available anywhere. I, I wanted to talk about Robert Pattinson, but maybe he doesn't talk to you. He doesn't speak to you. <laughs> but Robert Pattinson, he was a tortured vampire oh, well, in Twilight, you know, and he became Batman. So it's quite a move. But um, I mean, it's not a big change, but um, in a way, I mean, I don't know. Robert Pattinson is a pretty good example as well because he was he very and and Johnny Depp as well like they're you know they're the pretty boys they're the heartthrobs they're the ones that are on all the the teeny bop magazines and they hate that persona they hate that lifestyle they hate that presentation of themselves and so then they make very alternative decisions to counter that and reestablish themselves and again sometimes it takes years like Johnny Depp he was on 21 Jump Street and he he hated it. I mean, he's, you know, it's an awesome show, but it just wasn't for him. And so then he starts hanging out with Tim Burton and making Edward Scissorhands and Ed Wood. And then he goes and he does, you know, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And he basically spent the 90s trying to disassociate himself from that 80s persona of a teen heartthrob. And it took him like 13 years with uh, Pirates of the Caribbean to really get where he wanted to be as an actor and get the respect that he deserved as an actor because he was nominated for Best Actor for Captain Jack Sparrow in the first one. And then he followed it up with Finding Neverland, where he was also nominated. And from that point on, then he was, you know, he was a bankable, accessible guy. And Robert Pattinson kind of had the same deal going on with Twilight. And then he made some very, <laughs> very interesting decisions. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, go check out a film called Good, Good Time. Time. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is a Robert Pattinson like tour de force in 
disassociating himself from anything that came before and reestablishing himself moving forward. Yeah, he's great in that movie. And now a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Visually Hidden Selects. If you're looking for a spoiler-free recommendation of a classic film with professional analysis and insight, check out Visually Hidden Selects exclusively on the Visually Hidden YouTube channel. Our VHS film this week is The Razor's Edge, starring Bill Murray from 1984. And this was his follow-up from Ghostbusters. And it was not very well received. When this film came to me, I was very much still into uh, Bill Murray. And to know that this was his first foray into drama. I mean, even Tootsie with Dustin Hoffman. He has a supporting role, but he's really the comic relief in that particular film. He's supporting, he's a small role, and he's he's not carrying it the way he does Ghostbusters or Stripes. But this was Bill Murray's first foray into hard drama, real drama. And it just was not well received. And I'm I can only chalk it up to typecasting and the critics. Uh well for me I didn't, I never heard of this movie and I'm a massive Bill Murray fan. Um, but like you said, it's not one that's talked about, but you introduced it to me maybe 10 years ago. So it was the first time I had ever seen it. And yeah, you know, as much as I love Bill Murray, this one for me just doesn't land. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. I just think there's a lot of missed opportunity in the movie. Actually, I feel quite the same as uh, Steve. I didn't know about this movie before. Uh, and I love Bill Murray. And I don't have the same uh, vision of you of him because actually I, I love Wes Anderson's movies. So I saw him in, in those kind of movies. So I wasn't really surprised to see him in those this kind of movie. But yeah, this, this movie is not a bad one for sure. Uh, probably underrated movie because it was hard to find it out. So I guess it wasn't a, a big success. But, um, you know, it's it was pleasant to see once. I won't recommend it to my friends, I think. And um, yeah, by for curiosity, but that's all. <laughs> It's it's like a eat and pray. It's interesting uh, that you guys love movie, you know, eat pray love movie uh, with Julia Roberts. For me, it's kind of the same movie. <laughs> I don't I don't know that movie. Okay, <laughs> but it's interesting that you guys mentioned how how it came to you. Clearly, it came to you through me, but it came to you at different times. So, like, I saw this movie when I was a teenager, and up to that point, Bill Murray dramatically had only really done Rushmore. Mm -hmm. I don't even think he had done Royal Tenenbaums yet. So you're looking at it from a completely different direction in his career. And so when I saw it up to that point, it was still sort of at the beginning. So for me, that journey and that pursuit of him as an actor and what he was trying to do is a different perspective than what you guys are experiencing where it's like oh yeah you've you've already experienced lost in translation and you've seen you know uh what's the one with uh um, broken flowers saint vincent broken flowers and saint vincent you've seen all of those attempts at at it so for me you know it was kind of a it was kind of a revelation for him as mm -hmm. an actor and then i did really just enjoy the uh the journey of the story. Plus I've seen the original film from 1946. I've read the book. So my experience with this story is going to be completely different yeah. than what you guys have going on. But also I think it's also interesting just the, uh, the time in which you guys experienced it. So I was, I would be curious if you had seen it earlier than his uh, dramatic works that you were familiar with prior how it would uh, compare. Yeah, sometimes just seeing it at a certain time in your life does make all the difference. You know, very quick story. I, I grew up loving The Sandlot. My brother saw The Sandlot, but like, you know, late teens, it didn't land the same for him because, you know, being young and playing baseball as average of friends, you know, it, it just didn't, it wasn't the same, you know, because I was like, I was on a little league team when I saw that movie. So it was like right in that wheelhouse, it was right in that sweet spot. So yeah, it just it depends on when you see it in your life, right? Well, and also Anne had mentioned Eat, Pray, Love, and I'm not familiar with that. I, I know it's a more contemporary thing. And again, The Razor's Edge, the novel is from the 1940s. It's a it's a 
classic in that sense. And even the film itself, the original version from 1946, was very well received. So for me, again, it's like, okay, well, maybe this was an influence on Eat, Pray, Love. And so for me, I always want to go back to the source. Mm -hmm. You know, I when I was younger, I loved Quentin Tarantino films and I still enjoy them here or there, but I don't gush over them the way a lot of people do. I haven't seen his last two movies. That's how that's how involved I am with what he has going on, because it got to a certain point when uh, around Kill Bill, where I started to see like, oh, well, these are all just like influences from these other films. Let me go see these films that he was watching that brought him to these conclusions. And so then I just follow the line back like a detective. Mm -hmm. I go and I search for the source. And then I usually find a much richer well in the source than in the derivative contemporary entertainment. But you, but but that's you wouldn't me. have found the source if it wasn't for QT, so... No, no, but at the same time, you know, I, um, it kind of, it shakes my perception of his voice and his originality where it's like, oh, well, if he's just cherry picking his, you know, greatest hits, (laughs) I'm going to go check out the albums that inspired this. So no, and you're not wrong. And he does, you know do great work and he is a smart dude but for me i'm just not as uh, enamored with it because i guess i'm just i'm I'm more curious at what's behind the curtain no i get that absolutely um so i don't know for me and i feel i feel like the razor's edge is one of those kinds of films where it's like okay there's a there's an inspiration from this story let me go to the source yeah um I guess if we want to break this down, let's start with Bill Murray as the as the actor. Um, I think for me, I totally can relate and appreciate that this is a passion project for him because I've got a couple of my own. I totally get that. I, I believe me. Um, I just think he was a little too close to it. And I think it was to the to the detriment of him. The fact that he wrote it and started in it. Again, this goes back to what I said earlier, I, you know, are you the right guy for the job or do you just want the job? I don't necessarily think he was, he's not bad in this movie, but he's not as good as he could have been. And I think that's a, it's a, it's a multifaceted problem. I think it's, he is who he is and he has a certain style. And I personally love his, his humor. He's like a, he's like a King in my house. Um, But also I think there were certain parts where that humor just didn't work for me. And I think the the other part of this problem is I don't think the director had the guts to challenge him and push him as much as he could have. I think he could have got more out of Bill Murray's performance had he had a little balls and to stand up to him because he is the king of you know a king of comedy at that point in time. He's a, he's a Saturday Night Live and you know Ghostbusters is, is skyrocketing. It could be an intimidation factor. Like I, what can I say to Bill Murray to tell him you know who who am I to tell him what to do? Um, so I think that part, you know, was part of it. And I think, I just think the other part of the problem include regarding Bill is the script. I think the script was weak. It could have been a lot better. Um, but that's, you know, that's my take on it. But I think all those things affected Bill Murray's overall performance in the long run. Um, he's got some great moments in it. I don't, I don't take that away at all. Um, but I think it could have been so much more had he been pushed. I I also thought that the, um, the 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 script is a bit weak. Uh, the you feel there there is a deep message, but it just uh, on the surface, you know. At the end of the movie, you're like, okay, so what? You know what I'm saying? I was really disappointed by the end. Even if I see an artistic point of view at the end, I see something very artistic. But that's the thing. And when you start watching the movie, for me, it's a typical American movie. No offense, but. Um, with n- not much ambition on it. And at the end, you see that it, during the movie, it really changes the, the way they explain the story. And it, it sounds more like a European movie, uh, in my opinion, at the end, with more uh, meaningful meaningful silences and, um, you know, uh, no much um, banal monologue, you know, <laughs> like you can find sometimes in the American movies. So I see an evolution in the movie, but it doesn't make sense. You know, the whole thing you like, okay, it's 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 weird to have two hours with 
you, it's like two movies in one and I don't know, it was a bit confusing for me. So I agree with you that we feel it's really something you wanted to do that the actor wanted to do. And for me, it's it's not a very different performance he's doing because when you see Ghostbuster and you see this movie, the two characters he play, you can find similarities. So you're gonna say that, of, of course, for any actor, you can find similarities, but in a way that these characters has a charming face and he uses it, you know, and um, he has a, I'm not sure about the word, but malicious look, m m mischievous look, I think you say something like that. Mm -hmm. So he can make you laugh and he can also touch you. Um, so for me, it's the same type of characters. So I didn't feel like a, a big change in his career. But as I said, maybe my my vision is uh, biased, biased uh, because um, because I know I knew him from from other movies. I don't know, but uh, yeah, it's it's a bit. I, I was a bit disappointed about this project, and uh, yeah, he did better for me. <laughs> Well, I feel like at that point in his career, it wasn't even necessarily the director's fault so much as it was Bill Murray's fault and Bill Murray's ego. Because again, like Anne said, like you watch Ghostbusters and you watch this back to back and you can see like very, very similar shades mm -hmm. of the guy, you know, and even in Stripes, you know, it's like that's Bill Murray. That's what makes Bill Murray the star is because he's Bill Murray. He's always going to be Bill Murray. It's like Tom Cruise. You hire Tom Cruise for Tom Cruise. You don't hire Tom Cruise for whatever character he's trying to be or portray because right. you want that Tom Cruise element. And that's the Bill Murray element. And of course, when he was younger, it was much sharper. It was less refined. Yeah. And so I feel like, yeah, it's not even so much the writing or the directing as it is Bill Murray. And yeah, the director could have stepped, but the director wanted Bill Murray. Yeah, no, you're right. And so he got Bill Murray. There were, there are a lot of actors who were interested in this. I know this particular novel is uh, very important to Steve Martin mm. as well. But again, at the time in 1984, Steve Martin, I don't think he would have done no, any better than Bill Murray in this particular role you know that would have come later yeah, no, right and him. i say this with, with with great love and admiration because both of those both of those men are gods in my house um you know with me and my children so it's like i i say that with much love and affection no they would not they would not it's just not the right thing and that's like i said earlier it's like being self-aware as an actor is one of the most important things because it'll you will avoid a lot of heartbreak you know like for instance right years ago like would I have liked to be Danny Zuko in Greece? Yeah, but you know what? I'm not the Danny Zuko type. I'm more of a Kaniki type, you know. And and it's it's knowing that type of stuff, you'll save yourself a mm -hmm. lot of time and a lot of heartbreak and wasting everyone else's time. Why go into a, a you know an audition? I want to play this person. You're completely not right for it. Earlier, you had mentioned uh, Jim Carrey and the Majestic, and I feel like this is Bill Murray's yeah. Majestic, or that's. Jim Carrey's Razor's Edge, you know, it's like there's there's something that's off. But at the same time, when you first experienced the Majestic, you were probably on such a Jim Carrey yeah, high sure. <laughs> in your life that you just you you accept and you embrace that movie. And I think it's kind of the same thing that happened to me with this movie. It's like, yeah, no, this is this is there's like I, I see past mm -hmm. the problems yeah to to the core at what they were getting at because i'm like at the time i saw it i was like so in tuned to bill yeah. murray that i'm on the same same wavelength as him as you are with jim carrey in majestic Absolutely. And, as Anne is with jared leto in everything <laughs> well even even He's while the I was watching the majestic in the in in the theater <laughs> there was a couple moments where i was like uh. That, that could have been a little better that you know but like but the love wow. is, the love is yeah. still there but like you know no for me when he, he acts like a fool it's because he feels bad bad about what he's about to tell her because he wants to break his engagement and he doesn't want to break the, his engagement because he doesn't love her it because he knows that he has changed and and he's not the man that she she wants to anymore and it's hard for for, for her to understand it so that's the way I mean, he's about to say something terrible when you think about it. And because he loves her so much, he's going to break uh, break up with her. So it's a, a very complex situation. 
and he feels bad about it. And that's the way he, it, that's exactly what we said about uh, uh, co um, comedian actors doing dramas. Sometimes th when you do comedy, you, it's because you suffered a lot. And that's the thing, he's joking, he's trying to make fun, to, to relax the atmosphere while he is about to say something terrible. So I love this scene, actually. Well, that's actually where, where I came around to it, because then I, you know, I, the more I've watched it, the more I've seen it, you know, I start to think about the actor and I start to think about the character. And yeah, it's, it's defense mechanism. It's like psychology 101. It's a defense mechanism. He's trying to bring levity into a otherwise, you know, dark and dismal situation for him. So it's total defense mechanism. Well, I have thoughts on all of that stuff, actually, because this is part of the problem I had. Now, I don't, you know, full disclosure, I've never read the book. Full disclosure, I've never seen the film from 46. Don't know it. All I know is this film. But going on this film, here's my problem with the writing, is that he's with Catherine Hicks. And quite frankly, who wouldn't be? I love Catherine Hicks, right? But then you get that scene in the beginning with Teresa Russell with the poetry where they're still in love with each other. So right away, we know he's kind of settling with Catherine Hicks. He's not really happy in that relationship, but it's like, eh, well, she's with Bob. I'm with her, it, and it is what it is. What it is. He goes to war, traumatic experience. He gets, you know, basically his life saved, right? And it's like, ooh, it's like a, it's like a, you know, do over. And he goes back, and he realizes he doesn't want to be a part of that life anymore. And I agree, he doesn't have the courage to tell her he doesn't want to be in that relationship. But I think what it is is he never wanted to be in that relationship. But now he realizes how fragile life is and how quickly it can come to an end. He doesn't want to spend his life pretending anymore. That's really what that is. He was never really, he. I'm sure he had love for her, but he. I don't think he was in love with her. He's in love with Teresa Russell. You know, you go through all these things with on this adventure with him, and then. What bugged me the most was when he comes back from the enlightenment from the top of the mountain, he goes right back to the fish market. And it's just like, okay. And why would you, you, you were already at the fish market. You, when you left, you know, you came back from the war, you told Catherine Hicks, you needed a timeout. You went to France, you got a job and you were kind of happy of being away from her. And then he, he furthers his journey of self-enlightenment, and that's okay. But then he comes back and goes back to the exact same job. And then he goes back hanging out with her, and then he stumbles upon Teresa Russell, and they re-engage that. And for me, actually, when they reconnect from that point of the movie on is probably the most fascinating part of the movie. That's probably the, the, the meat of it for me. And I think the whole beginning was a little boring. You kinda, you're watching him go through this journey, but I feel like you're not really... It was kind of like a like a very light Forrest Gump. He's just, you're watching him do all these things, you know, kind of a, kind of a deal. Um, but at the end of it, he still wants to be with his original love, you know? So it's, I don't think he was ever really in love with Catherine Hicks. He cared for her. He didn't want to hurt her feelings. I don't think it's so much about the decision that he had to make or the decisions that he made. I think everything you said is pretty correct and clear with his, with regard to his feelings towards both of those women. I feel like the conflict and the drama arises from Isabel oh, yeah. and her feelings towards him and her possessiveness towards him. And so much so that then she ultimately betrays Sophie mm -hmm. in the end you know, and uh, yeah, it's 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 hard for me to talk nicely about Catherine Hicks in this movie. Yeah, she. I mean, she's a piece of work in this one, um, and and she's a piece of yeah, something. she's a piece of work. But you know, I got to I got to you know, she she's definitely the antagonist, and she's trying to make Larry fit into this mold of who she wants him to be, and not really be there for the person that he is, uh, and that comes through loud and clear. And, and that's and this is this is probably where I have the biggest problem with the writing of this movie is I feel like the character of Sophie and that arc is the strongest one in the movie and it takes the least time to develop. I feel like, you know, like you see these, like she's with Bob and so, oh, I, I, well, I, you know, I've always thought I was going to marry you, but you're going off to war. Bye. And then she has the kid, you know, when he comes back and then like they, he dies and then she's like, has a breakdown and then she's a prostitute and then she's dead. And that is a full arc. 
and you see the pain of what she goes through, you know, when she slaps the nun and the, the drugs come out and now she's hooked on that stuff. So inadvertently her life is fucking ruined. So like you see this, you know, how this woman started as this innocence and she writes poetry and she has all this love in her heart. And then she just goes through this, this traumatic shit and ends up dead because of it, where I feel like that took, if you probably cut it down, it's probably like a half an hour's worth of the movie. And this was a two hour film. And this, the, the person with the biggest arc should have been Murray. And I feel like, like, what are you going to do now, Larry? I'm going home. It was just like, okay. Like, well, I, I feel like that's not exactly right. But, <laughs> and you seem like you have something you want to say. <laughs> no, it just, I, I didn't feel Sophie. Uh, I didn't see Sophie the same way as you, but maybe um, uh, that's my bad. I mean, uh, for me, she's not the love of his life. For me, the, the, the movie is about his uh, self fulfillment. I don't know if you say that, but you know the the fact that he's looking for himself, and at the end, that's what you understand. At the end, he because you know when she when she dies, when Sophie dies, he hesitates to say she's my fiance. There is a, a silence when uh, who is she for you, and uh, she, there is a silence, and then he says she's my she's my fiance, and he kisses her, and then he goes to to Isabel. He's a bit pissed off, but not so much. I mean, if you kill my fiance, I would be more irritated than that. So I, I don't know when he said, he said very calmly, you killed my fiance. And she answered, and you killed mine. Oh, it was a stupid answer. But anyway, but, uh, so <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Sophie, for me, is not the love of his life. For me, he was kind of a protector to her. Definitely he wanted to be his savior in a way. And for, uh, for Isabel, it was like uh, the convenient girlfriend at, at a time. And uh, he, he repeated the, the same uh, scheme, the same, the, the same um, story with her, but it didn't work. He couldn't find himself because he was repeating the same thing. So, and that's why I'm so disappointed about the, the scene uh, during the Himalaya. I think it was in, in Himalaya. Mm -hmm. Because that's so important. This, this moment is so important in his life. And actually, it's quite boring to watch it. And even his look, uh, I, I was uh, expecting something really, uh, a really deep look, uh, something really special on his face. And actually, he doesn't have a specific expression during this scene. Well, it, it's the moment everything changes in his life. In his life. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I was a bit disappointed yeah. about that. I agree with that. He just burns the book and, you know. I find it interesting, though, that you guys have conflicting viewpoints. We all, all three of us seem to be on like different pages with this film. But I think that's another credit to it is that everybody who watches it is going to have a different outlook, whether it's with regard to the character or with regard to the story or with regard to the arc. Like there's all these different components that hit in different ways for different people, depending upon where they're sitting in their life when they watch it. And to me, that is a credit to the film in that, yeah, like it's, it's inspiring thought and conversation and it's getting reaction. You know, everybody can sit down and watch mm -hmm. E.T. and love E.T. because who, who wouldn't love that little guy, right? You're like, it's like engineered to like evoke your love and affection, you know, as where a film like the razor's edge, like there's a lot of different things going on. And as I just said, like, depending upon where you're sitting, when you watch it in your life, it can, it can have a very different effect. So for me, that's a credit to the film, but with regard to Sophie, I do agree with Steve that she does have a great arc. I don't think it necessarily needs to be the focus of the film because I feel like Bill Murray's arc, he's continuing his arc throughout the post film. Oh, yeah. And I don't think that Sophie's arc should have been the focus. I'm just saying that it was the best of the arcs, even though I know Larry's going to continue on um, for the sake of the movie. I feel like, they, what, I guess what I'm trying to say is they were more economic with, you know, like how, the amount of screen time that she had for Bob dying and then the thing with the nurse and then the, if the first shot of drugs and like that was a lot more um, economic for the, for the film 
whereas like larry is, is, is like i mean yeah he's the star but like i feel like it didn't go anywhere for a while and then it starts to like i feel like once he reconnects with sophie that's where you start to see him that patience and understanding and trying to help another human being and try to but he, he's pulling in all the things he's 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 learned in his journey that's when it really kicks in so for me when they when they reunite that's where the movie really picks up I do really like the shot at the end going up that staircase and just how it fills the frame and how it kind of kind of mirrors his journey, you know, where it's like it's like this like kind of crooked road yeah. that he's, you know, trudging up through. And it even has like that that railing in the middle. That's like the, the point of the the razor's right. edge and he's just going up you know i agree with you it's it, there is something there um that's why i said previously that for me this movie starts like a regular one and at the end it's almost artistic because i don't know maybe i'm overthinking the thing but uh, the, the scene just before this one you see he has the conversation with isabel and he says you don't get it and she um, she climbs a very dark and narrow stairs. Um, and then you see him outside in a sunny day climbing a wide stairs. And the sky is the horizon, you know? So you see that this guy mm. is free of all this jealousy and, and love triangle and things. And he moves forward, forward while her, she's still in the past. She's, she's still thinking of him and she's in the dark place. You know, I really felt that way. Yeah. And for me, mm -hmm. that, that's why I like this movie. Uh, even if I said it's not a, 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 the, the best movie I ever, ever watched. But just for that moment, I, I thought, okay, it's, it's worth watching just for that. Yeah, no, he definitely ascends. And, and that's, I think that's, that's the thing for me, like I said in the beginning. It's not a bad movie. I just I feel like it's it's it could have been so much better. Like I, maybe in a, yeah. the hands of a more capable director, I think it could have been. You know, I, maybe that's what's what's kind of unfair. You know, it's like man, Bill Murray's Passion Project could have been, you know, something greater in the hands of someone who's more capable, um, who's going to push him and and you know make better choices. And I mean, let's do that take again. That wasn't so good. And you know, it's not maybe tone mm -hmm. down that piece of humor there. And that's what that's what is kind of sad about it. It's, I think it has so much potential because it really is a it's a beautiful story. But just just the execution for me is where it just it kind of dies out. So I don't I don't hate mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and I, I it's definitely I don't hate it. I don't think like oh my god, it's awful. It's not awful. Just it's definitely worth watching at least once if you're a Murray fan for sure. Um, I just yeah, it's not for everyone. I would say again. again. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you want to see it again and again, hey, yeah, go for it. But um, it's it's because there's a lot of great a lot of great stuff in there. I I just have this this thing about me. I've mentioned before, like if I if I like something, like I'll watch it again. I'll study it. I'll break it down. So I couldn't again. I couldn't tell you how many times you've seen this movie twice, and you've seen this movie once. I've seen this movie at least maybe 20 times wow. over the past oh geez like 20 25 years like especially when i had first discovered it and i was watching it on vhs like i watched it a bunch and then when i got it on dvd i watched it and then i like showed it to my wife and then i've rewatched it a couple of times in the past few years but when i was younger i watched the vhs a lot and so i've seen and again i've seen the original i have the original I've read the book. So for me, like when I watch it, I'm probably seeing and experiencing different things. And that's something that just ties into, again, like where the film comes to you, at what point the film comes to you and where you're sitting in your life when you watch it. There is an audience for this film that I don't think has connected with it yet. You watch so many times this movie, you don't see that it's too long. First of all, it's too long. You don't see that there are scenes that could be uh, removed. I never once in any time I was watching it the first time or the last time felt like, oh, yeah, this is this is too long. Because, again, it's under two and a half hours, which says quite a bit about today's, you know, standards of film. You know, most things are two and a half hours or yeah. more. And this film in that regard is really pretty tight. And when it's, you know, you consider it's telling a story that's taking place over the span of like 13 or 15 years, I think it's moving pretty swiftly as well. Um, it's kind of focusing on its, on its points and its moments. And I do like the way that it 
weaves the supporting characters into the story, how we don't check out and check back in the way Larry does. Like we're not just with Larry. Yeah. This film this- is about these people in these ex- in this experience in this time period together. It's not yes, Larry is the main character and we're seeing it and experiencing it through his eyes, but for the audience, we're able to keep in touch with Isabel and Gray and Sophie and Uncle Elliot. And, you know, they kind of cross cut where we see where Larry's at and then we see where they're at. And so there's like that parallel of them in this like turmoil of their life. You know, they're going through the Great Depression and the market crashing and losing their family members. And Larry is on the other side of the world having a completely different experience. And he's working towards he's not enlightened when he's up on the mountain. He's working towards enlightenment and so when he's done he goes and he looks at the horizon and he sees all the mountains in front of him and it's like okay that's the path those are the hurdles i have to overcome all of those fucking mountains to get to that that sun at the end that's my light that i'm i'm moving towards and so it's not that he's enlightened at the end and he gives a stupid smile and burns his books it's that okay I realize I have a goal now and I'm working towards it. And he thinks when he gets back, he goes, of course he goes back to the fish market because what's he going to do? Go get a fucking job in a cubicle. He's going to find another like deplorable job. He's going to start shoveling shit in the stables. No, he's going to go back to the fish market. He has experience. He likes doing it. He gets to eat well, you know, he's got good protein, whatever the fuck his reason is. But then he gets Sophie who is kind of like a throwback. It's almost like a test, you know, and he goes through those motions of trying to apply what he's been experiencing, trying to share it. And just as you guys said and saw, but even in the end, it's, it's that pathway to salvation is as difficult to walk and as narrow as a razor's edge. And so it's like the slightest miscalculation or the slightest whatever, like he should have left Paris a long time ago. That's why I question why he even went back. I mean, yeah, for me that I mentioned the fit going back to the fish job, because it's like you found a place where you were truly happy. You enjoyed your life. And then you, you went on this journey and then you went right back to the same place where you were already enjoying your life. Um, and then, yeah, he tries to help Sophie and get out of that bad spot and try to bring her back to life in a certain sense. And then she loses her life and then he packs it up and goes back to America onto his next adventure. Um, I just, I just, I just, like I said, I didn't read the book. So I don't know if that's exactly one-to-one what happens, but just I thought it was a curious choice. Um, but yeah, to, to, to kind of touch on what Anne was saying, was, that was a paradox of this movie for me. It was like, this movie is fucking long. And it's taking forever, but also thank you. They showed us a lot of stuff, and it kind of was all important. Like, and then I'm thinking to myself, well, what would I cut? I'm like, well, fuck, I can't cut that. I, I can't cut that. And like, then I'm like, well, what the fuck? Like, what? Where does that leave me? Like, it was very confused after I watched it, sitting there thinking, like, what would I take out of this thing? And then I realized it's my problem is with the writing. They didn't. They, everything mm-hmm. that was in there needed to be in there, but you didn't maximize the opportunities inside those scenes. That's where it felt. That's where it fell mm-hmm. short for me. Well, yeah. I mean, I think everybody should see it at least once because it really is a cool story. You know, it really is a good story. Mm-hmm. There's a good message in there, and there's some great performances in here. And there's a there's a there's more good in this movie than there is bad. And the stuff that I picked out is is me being a bit nitpicky and whatever. I was impressed by the costumes. Uh, I think they were pretty well done, and um, for 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 any period of time during the war, during uh, at the end, um, it, it it was well done, except maybe the the policeman when they they come to to tell him that Sophie is dead, they look more like uh, Chicago policemen. You know, I felt that way. Uh, they don't really look French, mm. except that everything was. Uh, was was great. I, I I like the costume. The I personally I like the the landscape, um, the locations and everything. I mean, how was it for you watching it? Because a good part of the movie takes place in France. So, what was your experience as a native French person witnessing this in the film? 
really accurate um, about the French culture, the, the the talks, because sometimes in American movies that some some scenes take place in France, but the the French speakers have an accent and you can understand they're not French, and really it it wasn't the case. So a good surprise, I would say. Um, and and the location, yeah. But now I know that it was really in Paris, but yeah, it looks uh, it looks right. So yeah, it uh, it uh, enlightens my country, my, my my city, I would say. So um, yeah, good. The first time I watched this movie again was ten years ago upon your recommendation, and I will say that I took away more out of it now than I did then. I mean, I still have the same issues with the movie uh, it, from a technical standpoint, but f for from the um, philosophical standpoint, maybe, or intellectual standpoint, maybe, um, I took more out of it this time. Maybe that's because I'm now I'm married. I have I have children. I've lived more of a life. I've had adventures. You know, I've had a near death experience. So maybe you know the perception. You know, like you said, you, when you find a movie at a certain point in your life, it's like okay, well. You appreciate it for a certain reason, but now, now that I've had other experiences, and I'm not recommending that everyone go out and have a near death experience, but m I appreciate that point of view that he has post pre death experience. Whereas, like, I got to do some stuff that makes me happy. I got to go figure out whatever it is that gets me going, and then, and, and like, let's do that instead of just settling for X, Y, and Z. So I, that part. From an intellectual standpoint, you might always be able to appreciate, but if you live through something like that, there's a more of an emotional response then. So yeah, so there's certain things I appreciated more the second time around. You should try the 20th time around. <laughs> <laughs> I will say the uh, the one thing that I always love about this film, it's probably my, I don't know if it's my favorite part, but it's one of my favorite parts. Like when I think of this movie and I think of like what I like about it, it is that that scene at the end between Bill Murray and Catherine Hicks and not the line you guys were harping on, but more the one about when he confesses about the, the reason for his whole experience. You know, when Piedmont mm -hmm. died, I felt that I had a debt and, you know, and now I realize that there's, there is no payoff. There is no big prize like that, that nugget that it takes him the journey and the story and the movie to come to like, and then that he, he imparts it on her. And as Anne said, she just, you know, retreats back into her little, her little mansion in yeah. Paris. And he, he walks off and he ascends like that to me is like, wow, that's what, what a good no, ending. I... Like what a poignant, poignant moment, you know, and like to, to get through all of that and then just like concisely, like, there you go, put that in your pipe and smoke no. it. I, 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 I agree drop. with you. That was really good stuff, which makes me so angry that it wasn't written better, the relationship between him and Piedmont, because that would, the payoff would have been so mm -hmm. much greater. It's like, ah, you could have, you didn't seize the opportunity. Yeah, I get that. And, and for me, I guess it's just a matter of like, well, you know, that information is there. We weren't privy to it. It doesn't mean it wasn't there because clearly it did. So there's more than meets the eye in yeah. this story and i feel like like you can't show everything you can't do a three-hour movie but i i feel like what it sets out to do it does there are some opportunities there are there were some challenges but all in all like you guys agree it is worth yeah, watching at least once you don't have to watch it 20 times although it's you know it might change <laughs> your life no it's definitely worth it it's it's I applaud Bill Murray for having the balls to say, mm -hmm. hey, you want me to be in Ghostbusters? You finance this. That's balls. But also even just the the character actors that support this film and specifically Denholm Elliott. We had talked a little bit about him before and previously, but he played Marcus Brody in the Ra uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And here he is in this film. But prior to this, he was also in another comedy with Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy called Trading Places, where he plays... Uh, butler and here he's playing this very sophisticated aristocratic character and so he is basically what you would consider a character actor but he's not being typecast in any way shape or form he's you know he's like a go-to guy that fills a part or fills a role but it's usually a very different role i saw him in a short film where he was a um a railroad worker and he was just fantastic in it and again he's just has all of these different facets to him 
But again, he's just a character actor. He's background. He's not a star. Like before I was talking about how, well, that's Bill Murray. That's you want Bill Murray, you get Bill Murray. You want Tom Cruise, you get Tom Cruise. Like he has that star quality where he bring that's what he brings to the performance. And character actor like Den Holm Elliott, he brings something too, but he's able to navigate and negotiate the creative waters, I think, a little bit differently. But you know, those actors in the background, they always have a, a richer career. I mean, I feel that way, a richer career than the famous ones because they can play anything. People don't really notice them. I mean, we love cinema, so we notice them, but regular people, they, they don't really get their names and whatever. And actually, they have the, the, the richest career thanks to that. Yeah, and I mean, that I think that's part of the, uh, the interesting thing with regard to being typecast is like, that's what the stars are are looking for, you know, Bill Murray was looking for diversity in his creative portfolio, let's say, and Jim Carrey was looking for diversity and Robert Pattinson was looking for diversity and Johnny Depp and they had to really struggle even though they're the star of the film. They're they're the one who's basically getting the film made on their name, but they're not being fulfilled creatively and so they don't have as rewarding a career, maybe emotionally or psychologically, as much as the character actor that nobody really knows, unless you are a cinema buff. To be frank with you, I didn't really know the other actors in this movie. Uh, actually, the one I, I, I knew was the French guy. <laughs> so the guy who plays, uh, I think his name is jo Joseph, the servant uh, in the Templeton's house. I knew his face. As we said, he's, a, he's the kind of actor he's always in the background, but definitely he made many movies in France. So when I saw him, I was like, okay, he's a real French actor. But yeah, that's what I'm going to remember of it. And also the locations. I agree with you that this movie, it's... Um, that's that's what we you keep in mind, like postcards of those places. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to keep in mind uh, regarding this movie. It's a little unfortunate that this film did misfire the way that it did, because who knows what, what could have come out of 1985 and 1986 and 1987 for Bill Murray, you know? Maybe Criterion should put this out. Give it a remaster. Let me, let's see what it looks like, you know? Fix the color, you know, get some of that grain out of there. Adjust the audio a little bit, you know. Maybe, maybe a nice fresh presentation would bring some new things. I'd be, I'd be willing to take a look at it again, and, and, and not on some shoddy, broke down DVD, but you know, in proper quality. Mm, interesting. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's let's get on that criterion. Calling you out, the Razor's Edge. Yeah. Well, they they put out you know some questionable stuff here and there, and my opinion, but I think this one, you know, could uh, benefit from their treatment. On that note, we're going to wrap it up here today at the Visually Hidden Podcast. Again, next week, we're going to be discussing a completely different movie from our VHS selection. So be sure to head over to the YouTube channel and subscribe so you don't miss that. Steve is over at Steve's Pop Culture Corner on Instagram. You can follow him and check out what he's up to. Anne and I, of course, are also on Instagram as well as Letterboxd. And you can follow us there and see what we've been watching and what we think of it. Until next time, stay the course. <laughs>